everybody. So today, now we are going to start our session on external eye diseases and ocular surface diseases. So please stick on to time. Our time is uh, five minutes only. So now I will call upon uh, first speaker, Dr. M.D. Vasiula. Is he there? not there. Okay, Respected dignitaries on the dais, off the dais, and delegates, a very good afternoon to all of you. <coughs> My topic of presentation today will be ophthalmic manifestations of mucomycosis, our study. Mucomycosis refers to a rare, severe, opportunistic infection with fungi of the order mucorrhils. Mucorrhils have an intrinsic ability to invade the blood vessels and can affect different parts of the body. Cerebro-rhino orbital mucormycosis is most common and most aggressive form. Uncontrolled metabolic conditions, especially diabetic mellitus, is the main risk factor. Mucormycosis is a rare fungal infection. The incidence in India is much higher. Affected individuals may have poorly controlled diabetes, uh, metabolic acidosis, or immunocompromised states. Mortality remains high despite advances in diagnosis and treatment. Ten cases of mucomycosis were examined. Uh, eight cases had orbital findings. Detailed history taking, ophthalmic examination was done, visual acuity, slit lump examination, intraocular pressure measurement, contrast enhanced CT scan, MRI orbit was done. Associated systemic examination was also done, Tem uh, temperature measurement at regular interval of time, urine examination, blood sugar test was done and the results were analyzed. Lead edema was present in seven cases, chemosis, periocular edema, facial edema, discoloration of the lid, discoloration of the face were found in four cases and proptosis found in five cases, ptosis, ocular motility restrictions, diplopia, facial palsy and ocular pain was the varieties of ophthalmic manifestations. COVID-19 history was present in all the cases of mucomycosis. Uncontrolled diabetes was present in five cases and controlled diabetes mellitus was present in three cases. There was no history of malignancy in, in any of the cases. Poor general, very poor general condition was associated in one case and hypertension in three cases. Visual acuity was uh, more than 6 by 24 in 6 cases and 6 by 24 to counting finger 3 meters in 6 cases. PL negative in 4 cases. Uh, this is one of the uh, cases where the general condition was very poor and these are the uh, associated with lead edema, facial edema, pain, proptosis with a very poor general condition. And retroorbital amphotericin B was given 3.5 milligram per ml in 5 cases. Liposomal amphotericin B was preferred. Pre-injection uh, avil and paracetamol was given. First dose, uh, first test dose was given 1 ml containing 1 milligram without pre-medication. Hypersensitivity reaction was watched for 30 minutes. And then 1 ml of retrobulbar injection containing um, 3.5 milligram of amphotericin B was given. Posaconazole tablets were preferred, 300 milligram two times a day uh, on for day one, and then 300 milligram OD on day two onwards in all the cases. Exenteration of orbit was done in one case, entire eyeball and the surrounding structures including muscles, fat, nerves and eyelids were removed. Dressing of the orbital cavity was done frequently. Skin grafting was given. Posaconazole tablet 300 milligram twice daily on to start and then 300 milligram OD was given. Uh, this was the case which presented with restriction of ocular movement, ocular pain. Patient was COVID positive three months back. CT scan of orbit revealed orbital mucomycosis. So there was ptosis. In the cases, there was ptosis and restriction of ocular movement. Lead edema was not much. Facial pain was there, but facial edema was not much. So this is the view of the patient after excentration of the orbit. The, the orbital cavity was uh, subsequently skin grafting was done. All the in, um, extra ocular structures, the eyeball and the muscles, orbital fat, everything was removed. and the. <coughs> in the bony cavity, 
uh, skin grafting was later given this is the view after giving the skin grafting this is a histological feature of the mucomycosis mass the mucorails were found in the section so excentration of the orbit and debridement of the sinuses so the surgery was conducted along with the help of ENT department where uh, debridement of the sinuses was done simultaneously so rhino orbital cerebral mucomycosis is a very severe opportunistic fungal infection the destructive excentration is life saving retro orbital amphotericin b posaconazole tablet is helpful thank you for your patient listening So, good afternoon, respected judges and my dear friends. So, my study is on a randomized control trial between sodium alnurate and trihalose in dry eye disease. So, dry eye is a multifactorial disease of tears and ocular surface. It causes discomfort, visual disturbances, and tear film instability, damaging the ocular surface. And DED worldwide incidence are 5% to 50% and it is more seen in females and there is this increased dependence on digital devices has further enhanced the prevalence of DED. According to TFOS and DEW second, they, they have redefined dry eyes multifactorial disease of ocular surface where loss of tear film instability and hyperosmolarity leads to ocular surface inflammation and damage along with evaporative and aqueous deficiency dry eye disease. So there is a new topical drug th that is trihalose in combination with the existing lubricant that is sodium alunate is a naturally occurring disaccharide as proven to improve tear film homeostasis and benefit patient of DED. Uh, the mechanism of action is it, it increases the autophagy, it protects the cultured human corneal epithelial cell membrane, it prevents cell death from desiccation, it preserves the normal cellular morphology and functions of cell membrane and their proliferative activity. So what has been done previously, so there are many randomized clinical trials, but the most studies, they have inadequate sample size or the patient were not followed for long enough. Only uh, Chiambara et al, they evaluated more than 100 patients in a RCT between sodium hyaluronate trihalose combination and sodium hyaluronate alone. So we planned this RCT along with larger sample size of 384 with 192 patients in each arm. This is the highest sample size in all worldwide studies. Participants were 15 to 74 age group, OPD patient complaining of dryness, watering, grittiness, burning and hyperemia, OSDI of more than 9, shimmer and TBUT less than 10 seconds included in the RCT. Patient with chronic drug intake leading to dry eye disease were also included. Exclusion criteria, prior ocular surgery and any previous ocular lubricants, AGM and failed to give consent. Clinically assessed by OSDI questionnaire, shimmer test, TBUT, fluorescent test, when visualized conjunctivitis staining score with rose bengal strip and follow up a patient on fourth and eighth week so these were the results female 59 percent male 41 percent the shimmer test when we compare from the baseline so it improves from 6.12 to 11.36 with a significant p value in the trihalose group and no uh, in the, uh, the standard therapy of sodium halonate alone it increased from 6.12 to 9.82 and we compare the tear film breakup time so it was again significant p-value in the trihalose group as compared to the SH alone. When we compare the tear film height, so it was similar in both the uh, groups. And when we compare the van Bistava scoring, again it was similar in both the groups. And again it was similar in the OSDI uh, in both the groups. So in the discussion, in this randomized single mass clinical trial, we found that treating dry eye with sodium alunate trihalose leads to greater improvement in shimmer values and TBUD compared to standard treatment with sodium halorate alone. And Chiambara et al, they also showed that trihalose is effective and safe with better patient satisfaction than existing halorate only eye drops. Merits of our clinical study, largest sample size worldwide, is strict adherence to randomization and masking protocols, relatively long follow-up, demerits, lack of use of more sophisticated tools for TF film assessment, which might influence the subjective OSDI scoring. 
थैंक यू थैंक यू सो वेरी मच yeah we are giving uh, uh, in the post op patients also we have started giving in uh, post cataract patients who are uh, means dry eye patients so again we are using it also in the uh, refractive cases when we are doing lasik again we are using the triloses you are using post refractive cases also you are adding yeah. triloses yeah yeah and uh, results are really good yeah. Yeah. so do you add Yeah, cryoprotective and uh, auto autophagy, autophagy, more known as bioprotectant along with autophagic what effect. Yeah. So what, is, what is your observation with the human capital CIA cases, like uh, blood vessels? Blood vessels no, I, I have no experience in using it. Yeah, it is effective, severe dry. Yeah, yeah, I showed in the table, so it's very effective. Yeah, it's effective. Thank you so very much. So can we call upon the next speaker, Dr. Kamakshi Baskar? She will be speaking on conjunctival autorotational flap in telegium surgery. Good afternoon, all. My name is Kamakshi and my topic is conjunctival autorotational flap in pterygium surgery is a clinical study. No financial interest. Pterygium is a disease of ocular surface which is a wing shaped growth of fibrovascular conjunctiva onto the cornea. It can grow either on nasal or temporal side of the limbus and it may involve one node both of the eyes. The size of the pterygium may vary from small atrophic stationary or progressive in growth and it distorts the corneal topography when extends onto the cornea and causes visual disturbance. The exact etiology is not known, but the evidence suggests that ultraviolet rays are the major contributing factors for the grow pterygium growth. Pathogenesis. Research, recent research studies points to the evidence of genetic component growth factors and extracellular, extracellular matrix remodeling. And pterygium tends to occur in hot and dry climatic conditions, and high risk prevails in outdoor workers exposed to sunlight with setting of high reflective sur surfaces. Symptoms include blurring, irritation, lacrimation, and foreign body sensation. The tractional pose and the pooling of tears at the head of the uh, head of the pterygium can be leading cause of corneal flattening. Early surgical in intervention can therefore reduce effects of corneal morbid morbidity due to pterygium induced corneal distortion and visual disturbance. Various surgical procedures available are Bayer sclera technique, amniotic membrane grafting, and autoconjunctival grafting. Bayer sclera technique is associated with high risk, and conjunctival grafting is associated with least recurrence. But auto conjunctival graft creates raw area superiorly. And conjunctival auto rotational flap surgical method was first defined and described by Spath in 1926. The main objective is to evaluate the clinical outcome of auto rotational conjunctival flap after primary pterygium excision. Inclusion criteria all the subjects with primary pterygium and exclusion criteria recurrent pterygium, pseudo pterygium, and anterior posterior segment disorders. My study design is a prospective study. Conducted in the ophthalmology department in GVP from April 2022 to April 2023. 25 patients are included who met the inclusive criteria. Visual equity is assessed in all patients and pterygium assessed under slit lamp and graded accordingly. Surgical procedure. Under local anesthesia, the conjunctiva of the fibrovascular tissue was resected and the fibrovascular tissue under the flap is resected. Auto conjunctival flap was prepared as thin as possible. Then the conjunctival flap is rotated nasal border towards limbus and limbal border towards the nasal side. Graft was sutured with a 10 nylon suture in four corners and subconjunctival decadron and gentamicin were given. Pad and bandage was applied. This is a pre-operative pterygium picture. And uh, here the flap is being 
rotated nasal towards limbus and limbus towards la nasal border. This is a procedure where nick is given at the pterygium and undermining is done and the pterygium is excised and flap is being rotated. This is intraoperative graft. This is another picture of intraoperative graft. And coming to the results, males were 12 and females were 13. And age distribution, 40 to 50 years were 10, 51 to 60 were 12 and more than 60 were 3. Bilateral was 40% uh, and unilateral was 60%. The follow-up period was for 6 months and recurrence is considered when fibrovascular growth had occurred at the site of previously excess pterygium crossing the limbus and extending out of the cornea. The recurrence rate of my study is 5.7%. The post-op findings, injection was in 14 eyes, retraction was in 7, granuloma was in 1 eye, edema in first week was in 7 and no significant findings were seen in 6 eyes. My present study recurrence rate is 5.7% and uh, compared with Mejia et al is 4.1%, Pulte et al is 2.7% and Salmon and Mansur is 10%. This is a picture of post-operative graft day one. My conclusion is after surgery, the patients had a follow-up for a six months and recurrence is 5.7%. Conjectural auto-rotation flap is equal as superior conjectural limbal graft and avoids raw area superiorly. It's useful in double-headed pterygium and also preserves superior conjectura for future uses. It's a useful technique in cases where it is not possible or desirable to use the superior conjectiva as a donor source. These are some of my differences. Thank you. You are not using limbal epithelium. Mm. They're just conjunctive after excising the pterygium, you're just uh, mm, putting it to nasal so to the limbus. Maybe limbus to the do you think uh, uh, recurrence rate is a little high? Mm, more. It is. Uh, so Less than amniotic membrane graft, when yeah, but uh, equal to autoconjectural graft, but uh, it is useful. Sometimes that superior raw area may be useful for other surgeries in, in later conditions in older patients, maybe who develop glaucoma for bleb and all that superior conjectiva may be useful. In such conditions, uh, maybe okay. my um, auto rotational flap will be useful. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. I will call upon Dr. Krishna Priya Kamiridi. The study of changes in mebomian gland function before and after cataract surgery. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Krishna Priya, and today I am here to speak about study of changes in mebomian gland function before and after cataract surgery and uh, no financial interest to disclose. And coming to introduction, mebomian glands are the large sebaceous glands that are located as separate gland strands in parallel arrangement within tarsal plates of the eyelid secreting oily layer. This oily layer which keeps uh, tears from drying up too quickly. And uh, coming to mebomian gland dysfunction, this is uh, one of the most leading cause of evaporative dry eye. Either might be due to the obstruction of terminal glands or changes in glandular secretion or might be due to the gland loss. And prevalence of uh, mebomian gland dysfunction in Asia is about 46.2% to 69.3%. Uh, my aim of the study is uh, to study of the effect of cataract surgery on mebomian gland function. I have included uh, both the cat uh, small incision cataract surgery and uh, phaco emulsification. Objectives to observe the effect of cataract surgery on the mebomian gland function and to assess if uh, in type of cataract surgery has any role in mebomian gland dysfunction. And uh, materials and methods coming to the study type uh, analytical observation, observational study and I have included sample size of 60 where I have taken in group A 30 who underwent SICS surgery and 30 underwent FACO surgery by convenient sampling, informed consent and institutional ethical clearance was taken, uh, 3 months of study duration. Uh, inclusion criteria, we have included uh, age more than 40 years with uh, normal mebomian gland function prior to the surgery and uh, senile cataract undergoing uh, uneventful cataract surgery. And exclusion criteria, we have excluded 
uh, pre-existing infective or inflammatory ocular pathology, complicated cataract, traumatic cataract, and subluxated, uh, subluxated lens. Uh, here, uh, these are the ways we have uh, assessed the meibomian gland function by T of breakup film uh, time and uh, Schimmer's test, meibography uh, and uh, MEBO score by MEBOGRAPHY. Usually, MEBO score, uh, MEBO grapher is used, but we have used uh, uh, customized by uh, customized MEBO grapher by AR machine. And OSDR question, there are a set of questions um, which patient answers. And uh, coming to data analysis, statistical analysis, uh, descriptive analysis of continuous data was performed. Mepomian gland pa function parameters before and cataract surgery within SICS and PACO groups respectively were compared using paid t test And intergroup uh, post-operative changes in mepomian gland function was compared using independent sample t test P-value uh, P less than or equal to 0 0.05 was considered to be significant. And coming to results, there are significant uh, change between uh, all the parameters, dry eye parameters, which I have taken, Schimmer's test, TBUT, and OSDR score, along with MEBO score. Between both, in both uh, SICS and FACO, in pre-op and post-operatively. But there is no significant uh, change uh, in uh, post-operative values between SICS and uh, FACO, surgery, FACO emulsification. Coming to discussion, in our present study, we have taken 60 patients and uh, we have concluded that compromise in mebomian gland function causing dry eye symptoms after cataract surgery, irrespective of type of surgery. And uh, similar studies, Garby et al., and uh, which they have in, in which they have included 120 patients, uh, concluded that incidence of dry eye after cataract surgery was higher and mostly independent of demographic, anthropometric, and type of surgical procedure. And Han K.E. Uh, et al. have, uh, with, in which they have included 48 patients, they also have concluded that mebomian gland function may be altered without accompanying structural changes after cataract surgery. Limitations, uh, mebographer is ideal for studying uh, and analyzing, analyzing mebomian gland morphology, but due to unavailability in our settings, we use customized mebographer that is autorefractor keratometer, which works on the same principle. And conclusion, uh, there is compromise in uh, mebomian gland function causing dry eye symptoms after cataract surgery, irrespective type of surgery. And uh, here are my references, some of the references. Thank you. First of all, why do you think uh, mebomian gland dysfunction occurs after cataract surgery? Is it? I don't think there is any relation between cataract surgery and mebomian gland. Uh, there might be a, a little loss, uh, uh, loss in mebomian glands, ma'am, and uh, mostly it is due to uh, ab obstructive uh, type, ma'am. No, before cataract surgery, we assess mebomian yes, gland, uh, gland function and all. If it is severe and all, we treat it first and then uh, we go for cataract surgery. But after cataract surgery, what makes the mebomian gland to dysfunction? I don't know. I There can be dry eye symptoms yes, because we use drops, so many drops <coughs> and all. So, meibomian gland dysfunction as itself can occur after cataract surgery. The dry eye symptoms I'm referencing here. Dry yes. eye symptoms can occur. Yes, ma'am. Patient uh, post operative also people uh, keep complaining because of the prednisolone drop, greedy sensation and all. But uh, cataract surgery itself can cause meibominitis. Uh, I don't know. I don't. Uh, <laughs> I've never seen such cases. Before surgery itself, yeah, they can dry eye symptoms that they can cause, not uh, mebominitis. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Duration of the surgery, or did you find out whether there is an increase of <coughs> mebomian gland or anything? Duration of surgery? After, after post of one month, between <coughs> post of one month, we have followed up now.
are going to be Dr. Radhika Kasi Lanka. Is she here? Prevalence of dry eye disease among medical students in a tertiary care center. Next speaker, Dr. Triveni, please be ready. Good afternoon, everyone. I, Dr. K. Radhika, now going to speak about prevalence of dry eye disease among medical students in a tertiary care center. There are no financial interests. Uh, dry eye disease is a multifactorial disease of the tears and ocular surface that results in symptoms of discomfort, visual disturbance, and tear feeling instability with potential damage to the ocular surface. It is accompanied by increased osmolarity of the tear film and inflammation of the ocular surface. The overall prevalence of dry eye disease ranges from 5 to 50 percent depending upon the criteria, age, sex and population studied. It is usually more common in Asian population than in Caucasian population and prevalence rate increases with age. Although numerous studies have been conducted to investigate the nature of dry eye disease, only few studies have been attempted regarding the characteristic of dry eye disease in healthcare personals. Aim to estimate the prevalence of dry eye disease among medical students in a tertiary care center. Objectives is to st study and analyze the dry eye parameters in medical students and to assess the association of dry eye with average screen time in medical students. Uh, it's a cross-sectional type of study with duration of three months and the sample size is 100 students. Uh, consecutive sampling method is followed. Uh, study population is medical students of Ashram. Study area is Department of Ophthalmology Tertiary Care Center. Inclusion criteria is medical students who are willing to participate are included. Exclusion criteria is we excluded glaucoma, strabismus, severe trauma, contact lens virus, and uh, students undergone refractive surgery for vision correction, other uh, ocular eyelid surgeries that may affect the ocular surface health. A methodology approval was obtained from institutional ethics committee written informed consent is taken the study have been conducted by using questionnaire with two sections demographic data with pre-existing medical condition and average daily screen time categorized into le less than or equal to four hours and more than four hours i dry a questionnaire using the ocular surface disease index all students underwent routine ophthalmological examination along with shimmer test and tear film breakup time as a screening tool for detecting dry disease in tear film breakup time, we categorize it into breakup time less than 10 seconds, considered abnormal. Uh, test is re repeated uh, three times and average is calculated. In shimmer test, we categorize it into mild, moderate, and severe dry eyes. Mild dry eyes, 11 to 15 mm. Moderate dry eyes, 5 to 10 mm. Severe dry eyes, less than 5 mm. OSDA questionnaire, we categorize into normal, mild symptoms, moderate symptoms, and severe symptoms. The collected data was entered in Microsoft Excel 2010 and using SPSS 20.0 version. Descriptive statistics were used to summarize the demographic data. Fisher's exact test used for comparison between category va variables. Uh, the mean age of the study population is 21.88. And uh, in OSDA questionnaire, 52% of the sample is normal, and 17% has mild dry eye, 16% has moderate dry eye, and 15% has severe. In Shimmer's test, 62% of the uh, population uh, of the study sample has normal, 29% uh, has mild dry eye, and 11% moderate. In TBUT, 58% is normal, and 42% has abnormal. Uh, when it's compared with the uh, average screen uh, time, dry eye parameters have OHDA, shimmer's value, and TBET have significant uh, statistical association as p-value is less than 0 0.0. In this study, there is significant statistical association in dry eye parameters with average screen time in medical students. US3 et al. study concluded that drastic increase in use of digital devices after the initiation of COVID-19 lockdown and there is an increase uh, in prevalence of dry eye disease among medical students. Logra et al. stated that prevalence of dry eye disease is more among medical students and more exposure to screen time has strong association with dry eye disease, which is also similar to our study report. A conclusion, the prevalence of dry eye disease among medical students is rising as a result of uh, increase in screen uses. Awareness of, about prevention of digital eye strain should be enforced in medical students to bring this adverse effects to a minimum level. These are my references and thank you. First is uh, 20 seconds rule, ma'am. We should uh, uh, tell the students to follow the 20 seconds rule. Uh, so uh, after uh, every 20 minutes, we ask the students to close our eyes for ten 20 seconds. Mm -hmm. Look at the distance. Distance, distance, distance of 20 seconds. Yeah. As far as possible. possible. Mm -hmm. uh, every 20 minutes, we should look for uh, 20, 20 seconds, seconds as, as far as possible. Okay. any what type of dry eye that you say that 
Good afternoon, one and all. Uh, I am Triveni. I am going to speak about clinical outcome between conjunctal autograft and amniotic membrane graft in pterygium. Uh, no financial interest. Pterygium was recognized 3,000 years ago. It was described by Sustruta way back in 1000 BC in India. And pterygium literally means wing and is an encroachment of the conjunctiva on the cornea, more often on the nasal side, and is found in areas of high ultraviolet radiation, dry, hot, windy, dusty, and smoky environments. Ultraviolet uh, light, which is believed to cause pterygium, may induce chronic inflammatory cells in the conjunctiva or damaged limbal stem cells. Chronic inflammatory cells were shown to be present in the pterygium samples. Thus, chronic inflammation may contribute to pterygium occurrence. And the uh, incidence of pterygium is twice in men compared to women. Uh, different surgical approaches have been suggested for treatment of pterygium. And in that free conjectural autograft is a quick and safe procedure and amniotic membrane graft is another suggested procedure with improved surgical results. The need for conducting the present study is to compare the recurrence rate and surgical outcomes of primary pterygium with conjectural autograft and amniotic membrane graft. Uh, aim is to compare the recurrence rate and surgical outcome of amniotic membrane and conjectural autograft transplantation for pterygium. And the objectives are to study the recurrence rate and surgical outcome of amniotic membrane transplantation for pterygium and recurrence rate and surgical outcome of conjectural autograph for pterygium and to compare both. And my study is a prospective observational study of sample size 40 patients uh, done in tertiary care center for six months, uh, informed consent and institutional ethical clearance taken. We included patients about 20 years of age and primary pterygium of all grades. We excluded eyelid disorders, recurrent pterygium, pseudo pterygium, severe dry eye, and chronic ocular surface disorders, trauma, patients with uh, known immunodeficiency status, and prior history of ocular surgery. And patients divided into two equal groups randomly, and one group is for amniotic membrane, and the other group is for conjectural autograph transplantation. And routine preoperative evaluation was done. Uh, slit lamp examination of the type and extent of pterygium, uncorrected and best corrected visual acuity, uh, preoperative refraction, fundus examination, and grading of pterygium based on extent, uh, that is grade 1, crossing the limbus to midway between the limbus and pupil, grade 3 is crossing the pupillary margin, and standard surgical technique followed in both the groups, and patients were followed up, uh, followed up, up to 6 months. Assessment includes visual acuity and ocular symptoms like redness and slit lamp examination for grade uh, graft uh, position, graft edema and recurrence of pterygium. And the collected data entered in Microsoft Excel 2010 and analyzed using SPSS 20 version. Chi-square test was used for comparison of both the groups and the P less than 0 0.05 considered to be statistically significant. And these are demographic profile of the study. Uh, and this is clinical profile of the study group. We took laterality, location, and grading. And the occurrence of pterygium with respect to occupation. And the complications of, we looked for complications like graft edema, dryness, graft retraction, epithelial cyst, granuloma, delan, and recurrence. And both the groups have equal complications. Uh, this study concluded that both the methods were equally effective in treatment option for surgery with comparable recurrence rate and cosmetic results and either may be selected based on the patient characteristics. And other studies like Sandeep Kumar et al. concluded that both the procedures were equally effective in terms of efficacy and outcome. In view of uh, increasing incidence of glaucoma, amniotic membrane graft is viable alternative for patients. And other study like Mitra Akbari et al., uh, they concluded that more inflammation and recurrence rate was seen in uh, 
amniotic membrane group so it seems cat is the preferable method and we can also consider amt for patients uh, with glaucoma who require intact conjunctiva for future procedures and conclusion both amniotic uh, membrane grafting and conjunctival graft method was equally effective in treatment amniotic membrane grafting shows encouraging result in extensive re tissue repair and pa in patients who require filtration surgeries a uh, major drawback of this amniotic membrane grafting was its procurement under aseptic and sterile con uh, sterile condition in time consuming and require financial resources and conjunctival autograft technique did not require financial resources but a highly skilled technique and these are my references uh, thank you thank you Recurrence uh, in our study, uh, CAT is one mem, and this uh, amniotic membrane is two in two cases, mem. Dr. Nitish Kumar. This topic for presentation is topical anti-glaucoma medication and lacrimal drainage system obstruction. Good afternoon, everyone. There is no financial disclosure. Introduction. Long-term use of topical anti-glucoma medication can cause conjunctival hyperemia, subconjunctival fibrosis, cornea surface damage. These disturbances may be associated with the presence of preservatives or medication themselves and observed after long-term use of topical treatment. Lacrimal drainage system obstruction may also occur due to cicatrizing process such as drug-induced pampigoid and usually this occurs after long-term use of topical medication. Aim of the study was to study relationship with topical anti-glucoma medication with lacrimal drainage system of structure in Trusty Care Center of Dharkand. Materials and Methods Study Design Observational Case Series Study Duration January to August 2023 a Study Population 390 patients older than 18 years of age with the diagnosis of glaucoma who were receiving anti-glucoma medication were enrolled in tertiary care center of Dharkand. The study site Rio Rims Ranchi. Exclusion criteria was congenital lacrima duct obstruction, acute conjunctivitis, chronic cicatrizing conjunctivitis, previous lacrima duct or no surgery, lacrima duct trauma or vital radiotherapy, eyelid and eyeless malposition, untreated velephritis, mucous membrane disorder. Ethical clearance was obtained from the Institute Ethics Committee and the study was adherent to the tenets of declaration of health in can written informed consent of the patient was taken. Detailed history was Taken thorough clinical examination was done with slit lamp. Diagnostic probing and irrigation test was performed under topical anesthesia. Statistical, statistical analysis will be performed using SPSS version 22. The baseline characteristic of patient will be presented as mean standard deviations. Results after exclusion, case group included 122 eyes of 94 patients who were on topical anti glucoma medication. Control group included 274 eyes of 174 patients. Two group were matched and related to age, sex, and associated systemic disorder. There were sig significantly more lacrima duct system obstruction in the case group than in control group. Out of 122 eyes of 94 patients, in which 42 was male and 52 was female, in which 18.85 Percent was associated with lacrima drainage system obstruction in 270 out of 274 eyes of 174 percent in control control group in which 52.87 percent was male and 47.12 percent was female in which 7.29 percent have associated with lacrima drainage system obstruction. This is shown by the line chart based on diagnostic probing and irrigation test out of 20 25 eyes of 20 of 22 percent in case group. 72% have associated with upper lacrimal duct cyst obstruction, 24% have associated with lower lacrimal duct obstruction, and 4% have both. Out of 20, out of 21 patients in control group, 40% have associated with upper lacrimal duct system obstruction, 50% of lower lacrimal duct system, and 10% have both. This is shown by line charts. The 
when combination of timolol and dozolamide was used in 35 eyes 20% have lacrimal duct system obstruction when timolol alone used in 40 eyes 12.5% have lacrimal duct system obstruction when combination of timolol dozolamide and pilocarpine was used in 18 eyes 22.2% have lacrimal duct system obstruction when combination of timolol dozolamide latanoprilos was used in 14 eyes 14.28% of lacrimal duct system obstruction when combination of timolol and pilocarpine was used in 15 eyes, 13.33% have lacrimal duct system obstruction. Discussion. Some inflammatory and fibrotic change in the conjunctival surface was observed with topical antiglucoma medication. Two combinations of sig significant association with lacrimal duct system obstruction. Combination of timolol, dozolamide, and combination of timolol, dozolamide, pilocarpine. This is shows that combination therapy has more adverse effect on lacrimal drainage system than single therapy. Timolol reported to cause lacrimal obstruction and conjunctival fibrosis. Increasing age in the control group was significantly associated with increasing frequency of lacrimal duct system obstruction. Conclusion, this, the result of this study shows that patients on combination therapy has combination therapy with topical antiglucoma medication are increased risk of developing lacrimal duct system obstruction. The risk of obstruction is more in the upper lacrimal duct system. Patients who were using topical antiglucoma medication are at increased risk of undergoing surgery for lacrimal canalipolar stenting compared to patients who were followed for glaucoma or suspected glaucoma but not treated with antiglucoma medication. These are the references. Thank you. What are you going to advise for the patients in anti-glaucoma medications? How do you prevent? No, you can follow, but ultimately, what is the, how to avoid? Anyway, they are not going to stop yes, anti-glaucoma medications. Yes, extensive use of uh, this topical medication, awareness the surgeon to, uh, to prevent uh, advanced less Thank you. Thank you. Now I call upon Dr. Deepak Chaudhary. Dr. Neda Rahman. No, she is going to talk on the role of preservatives in ocular surface disease in glaucoma patients. Good afternoon, everyone. Today I'm going to uh, present on uh, to study the role of preservatives in dry eye disease in glaucoma patients. I have no financial disclosures. Ocular surface disease represents a spectrum of disorders that affect the surface of eye. Dry eye syndrome is one of the most common ocular surface disease, ranging from 5.7 to 21.6 percent. Dry eye disorder is characterized by inadequate synthesis of tear film to moisturize the ocular surface. Symptoms of dry eye disease include sensation of dryness, redness, tearing, irritation, burning, foreign body sensation, light sensitivity, and intermittent blurred vision. Prolonged use of preserved topical medications have a toxic effect on the ocular surface resulting in dry eye. Glaucoma is one of the leading causes of blindness worldwide with a prevalence of 3.54%. It's a progressive optic neuropathy and the primary treatment for this disease is topical anti-glaucoma medications. The probable correlation of dry eye and glaucoma is due to possible role of preservatives like benz alconium chloride which is present in anti-glaucoma medications. Therefore, glaucoma patients are at an increased risk to develop ocular surface disease as glaucoma patients are usually treated for long duration with preserved topical drugs. Glaucoma treatment causes uh, chronic inflammation or aggravates a concomitant ocular surface disease. Ocular inflammation may manifest as early as three months after initiation of anti-glaucoma therapy. 
prevalence of dry and primary open angle glaucoma varies from 11% to 100% depending upon age, sex and ocular hypotensive medication. Hollow et al. defined glaucoma therapy related ocular surface disease as imbalance of the ocular surface homeostasis caused by the toxic effect of chronic topical medication which leads to tear film instability, epithelial damage and inflammation. The aim of my study is to evaluate the role of preservatives in dry disease in, in glaucoma. Material Methods is a prospective hospital-based study on topically treated glaucoma patients attending tertiary care center in Jharkhand between December 22 to June 2023 who underwent detailed glaucoma and dry eye evaluation. 19 patients were evaluated out of which 11 were male and 8 female between the age group of 45 to 70 years. Inclusion criteria patients between the age group of 45 to 70 years who were diagnosed with glaucoma and were on topical anti-glaucoma treatment for more than six months. Exclusion criteria, use of topical medications other than anti-glaucoma drugs, any ocular infection, lid abnormalities such as ectropion, entropion, trichiasis and blepharitis, and prior lid or ocular surgery. Dry evaluation was done using Shermer test 1 and 2, tear film breakup time and tear meniscus height. This is a uh, diagram, sh photograph showing Shermer test 2, uh, tear film breakup time, and TMH tests. Uh, results of my study, uh, sex distribution of the study group was 57.9% uh, of the participants were male and 42.1% were female. Shermer 1 uh, tests, uh, most majority of the uh, patient, uh, patients of, uh, majority of the patient had moderate dry eye, uh, counting for 56.25% in right eye and in left eye also 57.14% patient had moderate dry eye, followed by uh, mild dry eye and then severe dry eye. Shermer 2 tests, 78.5% uh, patients had abnormal Sharma 2 in right eye and 68.5% had abnormal Sharma 2 in left eye. TBUT uh, in right eye, 84.2% uh, had abnormal uh, TBUT in right eye and 78.8% had abnormal TBUT in left eye. TMH, 73.7% had abnormal TMH in right eye and 63.15% had abnormal TMH in left eye. Conclusion, the patients on topical anti-glaucoma medications, topical beta blockers more than prostaglandin analog are more prone to develop dry eye. In my study, most of the patients have moderate dry eye followed by mild dry eye followed by severe dry eye. Glaucoma is a chronic disease which requires long-term treatment with anti-glaucoma medications and mechanism of dry and glaucoma patients are likely a combination of decreased tear production due to chronic irritation and increased tear evaporation from the meibomian glands and lacrimal gland dysfunction which is further worsened by the topical anti-glaucoma medications. Most commonly used preservative is benzalkonium chloride, which is a quaternary ammonium compound which causes alteration in the ocular surface by decreasing the decrease in the stability of the precorneal tear film and also reducing the density of the goblet cells. The chronic use of anti-glaucoma medication results in disruption of the corneal epithelium and a reduction in corneal sensitivity, which subsequently results in disruption of the tear film and thinning of the mucus, aqueous, and lipid layers. Ocular surface disease in glaucoma patients can reduce the glaucoma medication compliance and will ultimately reduce the quality of life. These findings can be explained by the likelihood of increased adverse effect of the medications and order the preservative on the ocular surface and the quality of tear film. These findings support the use of preservative free regimens or tear substitutes to minimize the adverse effects of anti-glaucoma eye drops on ocular surface. These are my references. Thank you. So you say it is under both evaporative as well as uh, hypertrophic. Uh, Thank you, ma'am. The next speaker, Dr. Nirlipta Das. Very good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my paper is Dry Eye and Meibomian Gland Dysfunction in Patients of Allergic Conjunctivitis in a Coastal Area. There are no financial conflicts of interest. Allergic conjunctivitis and dry eye disease are highly variable and two most common ocular surface inflammatory disorders. These disorders have been regarded as the epidemics of the 21st century, affecting the quality of life of people. Results of quality of life studies have shown that the impact of moderate to severe dry eye is similar to that of moderate to severe angina. Why the study? Dry eye hinders the removal of allergenic antigens on the ocular surface, which exacerbates allergic conjunctivitis. Similarly, allergic conjunctivitis has been shown to disrupt the tear film stability, contributing to worse outcomes in patients with dry eye. These negative interactions between the two diseases necessitate bidirectional diagnosis and management to prevent chronic damage to the ocular surface. 
Aims and objectives were to study the prevalence of dry eye in clinically diagnosed patients of allergic conjunctivitis, to study the prevalence of meibomian gland dysfunction in patients of allergic conjunctivitis. Material and methods, uh, it was an observational cross-sectional study, which was conducted from June to July 2023, and 32 patients having the chief complaints of itchiness and redness in the eyes were included in the study after taking proper written informed consent. In pediatric patients, consent was taken from the parents or guardian. My inclusion criteria were the clinically diagnosed cases of allergic conjunctivitis having the chief complaints of itching and redness aged from 7 to 60 years. Exclusion criteria were the patients on any topical medication, history of contact lens wear, history of refractive surgery or ocular surgery, history of ocular trauma, corneal pathology, systemic diseases like diabetes, collagen vascular disease, hypertension, and on medications like immunosuppressants and isotretinoin. My methods of evaluation uh, consisted of OSDI score, SHOMO-1 test, TFBOT, and slit lamp evaluation for meibomian gland dysfunction. Uh, the following were the results. The male to female ratio was 12 to 20, so females outnumbered males. Uh, perineal allergic conjunctivitis were, uh, contributed to 28.12%. Seasonal allergic conjunctivitis uh, patients were the maximum, contributing to 53.12%, and VKC was 18.75%. Uh, coming to OSDA scores, 18 patients had normal OSDA scores, 10 had mild dry eye according to OSDA scoring, and 4 had moderate dry eye. The mean OSDA scores uh, was found to be significantly higher in patients of perineal allergic conjunctivitis uh, with a mean of 20.33 plus or minus 7.22 standard deviation, having a statistically significant p-value of uh, less than 0 0.001. And according to TFBOT, 25% uh, patients had dry eye, having a TFBOT of less than 10 seconds, which included four patients of perineal, three of seasonal, and one patient of VKC. Uh, according to SHOMO-1 test, 10 patients had dry eye, having a value of less than 10 millimeter in five minutes, which included uh, five patients of perineal, four patients of seasonal, and one patient of VKC. Coming to meibomian gland dysfunction, out of the 32 patients, uh, 11 patients had associated meibomian gland dysfunction, out of which four patients had grade one, five had grade two and two had grade three, out of which seven were of perineal allergic conjunctivitis. So my outcome was allergic conjunctivitis was found to be more common in females and uh, seasonal allergic conjunctivitis was more common. Perineal allergic conjunctivitis has a higher prevalence of dry eye followed by seasonal and then VKC. And in our study out of 32 patients, 10 had mild dry eye disease and four had moderate. Meibomian gland dysfunction was significantly found in perineal allergic conjunctivitis patients at a 77.78% indicating its association with the chronicity of the disease. The limitations of our study where it was a cross-sectional study, not longitudinal, had a small sample size, duration was small, and mebography was not done. Coming to the discussion part, TFOS DWS2 criteria has identified allergic conjunctivitis as a probable risk factor for dry eye disease. Similar findings were found in other studies of seasonal being the most common. Mazumdar et al. had, had a similar inference of perineal allergic conjunctivitis having a higher prevalence of dry eye. Prevalence of dry eye in our study differed from other studies, and this decrease in prevalence could be due to climatic variations as our region had high humidity. Uh, conclusion, ocular allergy contributes to TFM hyperosmolarity, ocular surface inflammation, and damage, all of which are key mechanisms in the vicious cycle of dry eye disease. Meibomian gland dysfunction is a major long-term complication of allergic conjunctivitis. The inflammation response and continuous mechanical stress induced by chronic eye rubbing in allergic conjunctivitis are presumed to be as associated with the onset of meibomian gland dysfunction. Therefore, allergic conjunctivitis patients need to be screened for dry eye disease even after the resolution of symptoms and associated meibomian gland dysfunction needs to be treated in order to improve their quality of life. Thank you, everyone. Dr. Bharat Gurnani is here. So it concludes uh, our session. Thank you.